Hello friends, my name is Video Life, and today we're going to be looking at one of my favorite YouTubers, definitely my favorite Canadian YouTuber, JJ McCullough, and his video on how Canada could end. And because of JJ's eccentric looks, which you can see over his videos and uh, over, over all the videos that he's made over time, I've decided to grow this absolutely fantastic, stellar 10 out of 10, beautiful mustache. In a, in a sort of weird, I don't know, I, I thought it would be funny. I, I had to shave last night anyways, and I did everything except the mustache. I'm like, you know what, this would be funny, so screw it. I'm going to do a reaction video in it. So this is one of the videos that he made sort of in response-ish to What If Altist, the most popular video on this channel, How Canada Could Fall, or How Canada, I don't even remember the title of it anymore, but the most popular video on this channel, and yeah, kind of how this all got started. So I figured I would do JJ's take on it and see what he thinks. I think his is a bit more balanced response. And yeah, I hope you all enjoy it. I love talking about alternative history. I love talking about my own country. So hey, this is perfect. If you haven't yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. We're almost 600 subscribers. Thank you all very much. Sorry for the lack of videos. I was on vacation. I went to Prague. I went to Budapest. It was great. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I thought we would engage in a little speculative futurism. So a few months ago, a young YouTuber named What If Alt Hissed did a go. video Our entitled favorite. How Canada Will Fall, and ever since, a lot of you guys have been asking me to respond to it. Now, What If Alt Hissed is actually a friend of mine, and he consulted with me as he was making that video, so I cannot claim to be completely ignorant of it. I agree with some of his analysis, but disagree with other parts. But instead- that's the thing. So as that video has gone on, when I first started this channel, I didn't want to get into like super modern stuff. So I didn't really comment on it too much. I, I might revisit that video one of these days, like probably in a year or something. Maybe I'll do it exactly one year later. But that's got to be like, it, it, I disagree with way more than I think JJ does. So let's see how JJ um, covers this topic. Instead of doing a reaction or rebuttal, I think it might be more useful if I just make my own video on the same topic. So here are three theories on how I think Canada could possibly fall in the next hundred years or so, which is to say, how might the Canada that we all know today vanish over the course of the next several decades? And what might wind up filling this part of the map instead? America, apparently. Cool. I like this structure so far. So by far, the most popular theories of Canadian futurism tend to revolve around scenarios involving the so-called breakup of the country. This is a very common Canadian expression. You tend to hear a lot from politicians and commentators up yep, here. Breakup definitely. of the country. It is based on what I would call a sort of keystone theory of how Canada works, which is to say the assumption that all of the provinces are held in place by each other, meaning that if one left, all of the others might scatter too. Keystone theory evokes a certain idea of Canada's 1867 founding, in which the country was built to be a voluntary confederation between four different self-governing British colonies. So and one thing that's important to note here on this map is that uh, the, the most recent, well, outside of the territories, which the most recent one was Nunavut in 1999, um, Newfoundland, right, which is this part here, roughly, um, here roughly, is they didn't join Confederation until 1949. So when my grandma, when my grandfather was born in, in 1938, um, Newfoundland was not a part of Canada, right? And so these were the initial provinces of Canada, which then we slowly expanded out westwards, um, sort of in the same kind of, kind of style as Manifest Destiny as the United States that also expanded out westwards. Colonies. So the idea is that if one province opted out of this arrangement, the whole underlying premise of the country would be violated and there would be no reason for any of the other provinces to continue to play along. Canada has expanded dramatically since the founding, with many new provinces having joined, yep. and some and have always speculated that as the country has grown larger, the confederation deal has become more unsustainable, that sooner or later the different identities and interests of Canada's various component parts will come into some sort of irreconcilable conflict and therefore the country's ultimate destiny is to split up into a bunch of independent nation states <laughs> so i just want to point out here look at what look at what they put quebec reich <laughs> as if quebec has any sort of like german influence here 
So what is this? Al- Alberta Stan? All right. I don't think I would pick that name if you know anything about Alberta. People's Republic of British Columbia. I can totally see that. The Empire of Ontario. The Caliphate of New Brunswick. All right. All right. Maybe, maybe not those titles, but yeah. Something along... Imagine all these being different countries. Like, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, Saskatchewan being its own country. It's... it's Let's get real. Let's keep going. Independent nation states. Some go even further and speculate that Canada could even break down into just a few city states, given how concentrated Canada's population is getting in just a handful of big urban cores that are very geographically far from one another and don't even trade that much amongst themselves. The problem with this theory, however, is that I don't think there is much hard evidence that Canadians actually conceptualize themselves as citizens of a handful of isolated, mutually exotic communities as opposed to citizens of a larger nation. A recent poll by the Enveronics Institute found that the percentage of Canadians who say that they think of themselves as a resident of their province first or exclusively is incredibly small. Outside of Quebec, Quebec, which is yeah, there obviously we go. a special case <laughs> that we will get to later, Probably the Quebec only province Alberta. where over 30% of residents answered Alberta? yes to this question is Newfoundland, which oh. was a separate okay. country until 1949, which go. is to say within the lifetime of my father. Everywhere else, the numbers are below 20% and apparently going down. Polls also routinely show that pride in being Canadian is similarly high in every province, which is not exactly the sort of thing that you would expect to see in a place that is supposedly on the brink of being torn apart by regionalism. There is another very popular cliche that feeds into this idea, however, which is this notion that in Canada, the provincial governments are supposedly very powerful. Before he gets into that, I just want to comment on... um how people identify as Canadian rather than as Ontarian. Well, I'm, I'm from Toronto, so Ontarian, or he would identify as British Columbian. I'm currently in Austria now, for those who know, and I'm Canadian, so um, doing my master's here in Vienna. And what's really interesting is that when you meet some people from other countries, and the most recent example that happened to me is uh, a guy in my program from Italy. He said, oh, I'm from, I asked him like, oh, where are you from? Because this was the first time I met him, right? I didn't know he was Italian. And he said, I'm from Milan, right? And one of the other one of the other Italians in the program said, oh, I'm from, I don't remember the city off the top of my head, but it's in the south, right? It's just south of Rome. And I asked him, I said, why do you say like which city you're from? And you don't say like, oh, I'm from Italy. And they're like, well, sort of, they, 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 if I could sum up their words, if I may be so bold, they basically consider themselves to be almost two separate kinds of people with one guy being from the south and one guy being from the north, right? Milan and the other city. Sorry that I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, and I don't think that really happens with Canadians. And I don't think that happens with Americans too. But I'm curious, in the country that you're from, do you identify more with your city, more with your province? Or do you say, I'm Romanian, I'm Czech, I'm I'm Chinese, I'm Japanese, whatever, wherever you're from, right? Um, let me know in the comments below. I'm curious what you, what you guys think on this issue. Because I would say for Canadians, we would always say, I'm Canadian. You never say, I'm Albertan, etc. Let me know what you think. A certain sort of person even likes to go around insisting that Canada is a much more decentralized federation than the United States. Because, no. of course, we what? insecure would, Canadians have to hate the that. United States at absolutely everything, even subsidiarity. But we need look no further than the recent Roe v. Wade ruling to realize why this isn't mm-hmm. true. When you hear stories about the possibility of American women going to prison for having miscarriages or whatever, this is only possible because in the American system, the states and federal government share control over the criminal law, whereas in Canada, the criminal law is exclusively controlled by the federal government. And since criminal law tends to be the most moralistic form of law, this has a somewhat homogenizing effect on Canadian political values, in which Ottawa basically just sets a single standard regarding what the country is going to think about abortion or guns or how long murderers go to jail or what drugs are banned and other contentious stuff like that. The majority of the powers of the Canadian province provinces are service-based, which is obviously nothing to sneeze at in an era where we rely on governments for so much. But at the same time, a lot of provincial budgeting for services is also very tied to funding from the federal government. Take the famous Canadian healthcare system, for example, the single biggest expenditure in any provincial government's budget. Something like 40% of Ontario's budget goes to healthcare. 
Just think about that for a second. Technically, Canada operates under a patchwork system of a bunch of different single-payer health insurance plans run yep. by the provinces. But in practice, the federal yep. government covers about a quarter of all provincial health care expenses in exchange for the provinces agreeing to obey various national health care standards. Yep. The provinces all like this system, and if anything, want the federal government to do more, which in turn is one of the reasons why the health care debate in Canada is quite stable. Stagnant. The provinces are so dependent on federal funding that they can't really be experimental or creative in how they deliver healthcare. Since the federal government is able to wield the threat of withholding funding as a way to intimidate the provinces out of doing things that Ottawa doesn't like, such as, say, expanding the role of private insurance or private mm, hospitals, Ford. this is probably yeah, yeah, the yeah. case for other social programs as well, with most provinces getting about 20% of their total revenues for everything from Ottawa, a number that, again, most provinces want increased and has, in fact, mostly been increasing. And this is critical to appreciate because in today's Canada, nationwide government policies have become a big part of what patriotic middle-class Canadians derive their sense of national identity from, be it national gun control, national Medicare, national abortion laws, or anything else. Now, I don't want to imply that Canada's progressive social policies are all universally beloved because hmm. they're not. But at sure. the same time, provincial governments, even the conservative ones, do not tend to challenge them, either because they don't want to for pragmatic reasons, or they just constitutionally cannot. But either way, this lack of local pride and identity, coupled with a lack of a clear set of policy disputes with Ottawa, other than Ottawa is not giving us enough money, has made it hard to form viable provincial separatist movements in Canada. And the polls reflect this. A recent a research Except Quebec. Church Co. survey found the province of Alberta having the highest rate of residents saying they strongly or moderately agree that they'd be better off as their own country. But even then, it was just 33%. The average rate of support for secession in any province was in the 20s at best. But let us just talk about Alberta specifically. For yeah, so before he gets into that, I just want to just want to note this here, right? You even notice that there's so much talk about it. what's it called, Wexit or something like this. And I think I brought this up in the How Canada Will Fall video of how he's talking about Western separatism and Western joining the United States and all this stuff. And so, you know, you look at this one poll here and to be fair, I haven't, you know, I'm not going to look it up here and look into the sample size. I'll take JJ's word for it and, so, and how the, the polling was done. But I mean, even in Ontario, it's a quarter, right? It's a quarter, one in four people alleged according to this poll, in Ontario, strongly or moderately agree that they'd be better off as their own country. It's only seven per, seven points off of Alberta, which is 33%, right? And so to say that there's this massive separatist movement with that what if altist claimed in his video, right, that this could be a realistic scenario that they would secede and join the United States and all this stuff. It's like, there's no, like, it's all fun, I guess, but there's no, like, sort of evidence to really back that up. And this is what I'm liking so far about this video, is that it's like, okay, here's this poll. Here's what people think. And sure, in 50 years, it'll be different. Absolutely. No one can predict 50 years in the future. No one can predict, accurately enough, five years into the future. But if you take this trend now and you look back at history, there's not really any evidence for it outpacing Quebec as the province that is the subject of the Cry most baby. separatist speculation these Ooh, days. Oh, that's going to get Alberta some bad is different from the other provinces in that it does seem to have a fairly substantial policy dispute with the federal government, namely oil, which is also something that has become yes. increasingly central to the idea of what it means to be an Albertan. Alberta produces over 80% of Canada's oil, and it's been estimated that as many as a quarter of all jobs in the province are at least somewhat oil adjacent. But outside of Alberta, fossil fuels are of course increasingly scorned for their role in fostering climate change. And an industry which Canada's national government, especially under the current prime minister, has been eager to rein in. The Trudeau administration has introduced all sorts of new strict national environmental regulations and has even mused that in the long term, the Canadian oil industry is something that we will probably have to phase out for the good of the planet. Uh, we can't shut down the oil sands tomorrow. 
Uh, we need to phase them out. We need to manage the transition off of our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, that is going to take time. Rhetoric like this has inflamed a lot yep. of conservative Albertans with conflict over Alberta's right to continue harvesting and shipping their oil, often held up as quite literally the fuel of Alberta separatism. But and the thing is, is like Trudeau just cannot win on this issue, right? To not get into the weeds of the current political discussion, but even when he goes and buys a pipeline, right? He buys the Keystone Pipeline outright. Not to say he did himself, but the government bought the Keystone Pipeline. And it gets cancelled by the Americans, right? So it's like, can't win. That said, a lot of Alberta's long-term trend lines are also pointing in the other direction. Alberta is becoming a much more urban and liberal province than it used to be, much more dominated by its big cities. And yeah. its traditional grip by the more pro-oil and anti-Ottawa Conservative Party is accordingly starting to loosen a bit. The Albertans elected the more oil-skeptical left-of-center NDP party to power for the first time in 2015, and they may soon elect them again. As we Key point though is that they only lasted one term and then they were booted out by the UCP under Jason Kenney, which was basically a response to Rachel Notley. I don't know enough about her, but she seems like an interesting, charismatic figure. Um, but now that Jason Kenney's gone, who knows? We'll see what happens. Well, independent of climate change concerns, Albertan oil, which now mostly comes from the so-called tar sands, is also some of the most Brutal expensive oil in the world to yes, extract, exactly. which makes the provincial government very dependent on the volatile price of oil remaining high. So there are arguments that this just isn't a very good long-term economic model for the province as well. In any case, even though 30% of Albertans may claim to support it, Alberta separatism doesn't really exist is even an embryonic political movement. For decades now, efforts at creating a separatist political party have yep. flopped to the point where even parties considered to be separatist, like the Maverick Party, have to water down their language about how they're actually just trying to get greater fairness in the Canadian system or whatever. And, they and one thing about that too is that smaller parties are at such a disadvantage in the Canadian system, right? We have the first past the post system, which to make a, a complicated system short, the people who get the most votes in the riding, they'll get the seat and they go to parliament, right? First past the post. Most votes win, if you will. Um, actually, sorry, it's not most votes win because then if the popular vote, then you would have, for example, in the 2019 election, uh, the conservatives would have would have won because they got the popular vote, but rather it's who gets the most amount of seats um, as per the ridings. So smaller parties in Canada have a very, very, very tough time at actually making an impact. For example, the Green Party, which has been around since 1991, which I am not a very big fan of personally. No, actually, I think it's longer than 1991. Maybe it's the 80s. They've managed to get a total of three MPs. That was the max they ever had into Parliament, right? And that's for almost 30 years of attempting to get into Parliament and with social trends moving towards more towards Green. I mean, the country that I'm in right now, Austria, the UVP, governs with the Green Party. In Germany, we have the Ampelkoalition, which is the SP, S, ah, sorry, SPD, the FDP, and the, the Greens, right? So Green Parties are obviously making a big splash in Europe. But in Canada, it's just not there, right? The Green Party also in the UK is just not making the same type of attempt. Uh, same sort of splash. There can be more, this can be dip more easy with provincial parties, but even then, the, the, the major separatist party in Quebec, for example, was the largest party for a long time before those large separatist movements, the biggest one, the closest one being in the 1990s. Um, so yeah, so smaller parties are already at a disadvantage in the Canadian political system. So to get power, to be able to really move towards that Western separatism that What If Altis brought up in his video. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, our friend JJ here is sort of providing some some good some good arguments against that. They still flop. Basically, there for separatism to be viable as a political agenda, you need some sort of infrastructure to support it. Separatist yes. parties, separatist leaders, separatist media, separatist intellectuals, and so on. And the other thing too is like a lot of the times the separatist parties, they get, they get just mixed up with just people who make stupid mistakes and say stupid comments and alienate, you know, any 
centrist voter, if you will, right? And you can look into some of the separatist parties in Alberta or Quebec for that matter, um, you know, to see to see what stupid things they've said. None of this exists in Alberta, let alone the other provinces. The Wexit which is party why is what I'm I'm talking about. skeptical when commentators treat the breakup of Canada as something that is so obviously going to happen sooner yeah, rather I than agree. later. But totally. of course, there is one big exception to this, and that is Quebec. Quebec. There has been a lot of talk recently about the virtues of playing the so-called long game in politics and how the biggest victories come to the patient. And when it comes to Canadian Absolutely. separatist movement, no one has been playing a longer game than the French Canadian nationalists in Quebec. In the old days, people thought that Quebec's breakup with Canada would come in a single sharp decisive moment, yeah. like a referendum on separatism Brexit. followed Quebec's by it. a unilateral declaration of independence. And to be sure, those tactics have been tried. That is a terrible photo, but yeah, you can see here 50.9% no. Very close. But it is now looking like Quebec nationalists have been far more successful at just gradually edging their province out of the Canadian system to the point where they are already getting pretty close to being a separate country in all but name. Since the modern political rise of Quebec nationalism in the 1970s, successive Quebec governments have gradually entrenched French as the province's sole acceptable language of government and business. They've obtained control over traditional federal powers like tax collection, social security, and yeah. immigration, and basically just sought to enshrine in as many places as possible this idea that they are the special province that gets to play by a different set of rules than the others. Things have only accelerated under the super nationalist government of current Quebec Premier Francois Legault, Legault, who recently cajoled the federal government into approving a constitutional amendment to declare Quebec the nation of the French Canadian people. This sort of thing would have been considered a huge affront to the Canadian order 20 years ago, but today the country has been successfully conditioned to accept it as inevitable because of the way the temperature has just been slowly turned up over the decades. Definitely. So if you talk about French Canadian sort of uniqueness to more younger people, more people around my age, you know, 20s, 30s or so, it's sort of accepted in a, in a sort of way. But when I talk to my parents, when I talk to my grandparents, older people, colleagues, whatever about Quebec separatism and things like this, there's generally a much more hard line between Anglo and French Canadians when it comes to this specific issue with older Anglo Canadians being much more firmly against Quebec having sort of any special permissions, if you will, as, as they detailed there. And if I could just comment on the long game that he talks about, this is what makes, I think, Canada one of the most, one of the more, possibly one of the most um, stable countries in the world is our politics it's very just down the middle, right? It's very just floating along, right? Like, yes, we'll, we'll vote the conservatives in for a few years. Okay, we'll give them a minority, right? Okay, then we'll vote the liberals in on a majority. All right, then we'll give them a minority. And so we're just constantly going through the center, right? It's playing the sort of long game. We don't have those wild swaps that you see in some South American politics. Um, and in even some European countries, you don't see those wild left, right, left, right. It's that, yeah, okay, the conservative party is going to do here. They're going to implement some policies. All right, here's the liberal party. But it's still generally within a free market, capitalistic, liberal, you know, um, political framework, right? That still uses the first past the post system, parliamentary Westminster style. And that's just sort of Canada even of itself. It's stability, right? It's good order and good governance, right? That's what we were founded founded on one of those uh, one of those quotes so yeah it is now hard to imagine any future Quebec government putting any of this stuff into reverse or any future Ottawa administration daring to try to put this toothpaste back in the tube my assumption would be that in future decades Quebec we will continue to see Quebec play the incrementalist game with subsequent administrations acquiring the remaining symbols of sovereignty including their own passports currency Olympic team maybe even an independent armed forces whether they that one I completely disagree on. I don't see them having their own currency. Why? And their own armed forces. The Canadian armed forces got enough problems. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. We don't need a separate Quebec forces. But who knows? Maybe a passport. Maybe an Olympic team. I don't know. 
Maybe. This all culminates in Quebec eventually cutting the final cord and becoming an independent country, or whether the nation of Quebec is content being part of some sort of Kurdistan-esque autonomous yeah, zone. Or, or Andorra-esque. In Canada. Sorry, not Andorra, uh, Catalonia. Seems kind of irrelevant. The point is, this seems destined to be a corner of the map where the Canadian government is going to exercise progressively less and less authority over anything but but what i think though is that this isn't going to be something like where you have like a hard border between anything it's not going to be like this big break where quebec separates but separates sorry but i can imagine right i agree with jj in this way that between 20 and 30 years you would sort of have a i don't know just off the top of my head because it's the problem with these reaction videos i only get like four seconds to think um so sort of like an eu style border Right, where there's free trade between the two, there's free movement between the two. However, when you're in Germany, it's obviously different than when you're in Netherlands or something like this. Right, where Quebec doesn't secede from Canada, they will be a part of Canada, but they'll have more and more and more of these special permissions, which I'm happy JJ put it like this because, yeah, I totally agree. To exercise progressively less and less authority over anything other than signing the checks, of course. But if we get back to the thesis of this video, does the departure of Quebec mean the end of Canada? If you buy no. into the most narrow version of the Keystone Theory, which posits that this country is fundamentally a cooperation deal between the French and English Canadians, then any opt-out by Quebec obviously means the collapse of that dream. But I honestly think that to most Canadians, Quebec is becoming an increasingly ignored, yeah. out-of-mind place, meaning yeah. that- Definitely with younger Canadians. Even if Quebec did leave, I really can't imagine it would have much impact on what people in the other provinces thought about their own status in Canada one way or another. The only other form of separatism in Canada I think has some genuine momentum would be indigenous separatism. I talked about this a bit in my award-winning video, Canada Has Failed. But for a number of reasons in recent years, the Canadian government has become much more enthusiastic about the idea of maximizing the autonomy of Canadian Indian bands, adopting what Prime Minister Trudeau has often called a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. His government mm. likewise recently passed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is basically the most explicit acknowledgement in Canadian law to date that Aboriginal Canadians are a people with rights and powers that exist completely independently of the Canadian state. Canada has had Indian treaties and Indian reserves for a long time, but under the changing mindset of Ottawa and this new UN DRIP framework, there has become much more interest in basically revisiting all of the attitudes and institutions that have defined Canadian Indigenous relations up until now. This is sometimes described as the agenda of decolonization and reconciliation, but it can be pretty ambiguous what the end goal of it all is. Obviously, yeah. the original sin of Canada was Europeans stealing land from the natives, but so much has happened. <sighs> yes, that is true. It's very complicated though, <laughs> right? And not to get into it because this is not a history of Canada video, but it's, ah, uh, there's so much history to it and I would highly recommend reading it. The end conclusion though is correct. Yes, obviously, right? The, the end sentiment, but it's just, it's, it's frustrating sometimes when you read about Canada and you read about all the different treaties, the wars between the different indigenous tribes at the time, right? Even something like the Beaver Wars, which I've talked about a bunch. It's frustrating that it's, it's not this single dynamic of, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. I'll, I'll keep it at that. It's a complicated issue. And in the centuries since, that this isn't really a cake that can be unbaked. So that's that's the that's what I think is the most interesting. So what do you think politically about this sort of idea? But what's going to be interesting is that eventually when the Liberal government is no longer in power, because it's inevitable, we will get a Conservative government again. Whether you think that's a good thing, that's up to you. Let me know in the comments. Will the Conservative government continue this path forward? Personally, I, I, like, like with Quebec separatism, I don't see the toothpaste being put back into the tube, right? It's it's just, it would be political nightmare to try and roll back any of these measures. I think this is just the way forward and uh, and everyone, you know, that's, yeah, it's the way forward with Canada. Despite the slogans of some activists, the land is obviously never going to be given back and 
that was the funny thing about the university I went to, but that's a whole other Total. story. But that said, you could imagine a future scenario in which the various indigenous nations are permitted to exert more control over Canada in a sort of landlord type way, exercising more oversight and veto power over what is done on their traditional lands, which of course is basically the entire country. The Canadian judicial system has gradually been establishing an indigenous power of consultation and veto as constitutional rights in the Canadian system. And I would assume that if we extrapolate several decades or so into the future, you could imagine indigenous rights to have grown so expansive that the First Nations are basically co-governing the country in some way. Prime Minister Trudeau's administration has recently begun efforts to create something known as a Reconciliation Council, which is basically a body of indigenous Canadian leaders to supervise the federal government's decolonization agenda. I think you could envision something like this eventually morphing into some sort of co-governing body that could conceivably even supersede the powers of the Ottawa okay. government in various important ways. Now, could Canada survive this form of indigenous nationalism? I think there are certainly people on the far left who would like to see the Canadian settler state completely broken down and replaced with some sort of post-colonial indigenous-led society. But more realistically, I think you could also imagine some sort of post-apartheid South Africa type situation where the state survives, but with a completely different sense of purpose and identity at its core. There's a big issue with that though, and I'm gonna use a what if altist's favorite word, demographics. All right, when it comes down to indigenous Canadians, there are just, I don't agree with that theory that there would be a, an indigenous government as well as a Canadian federal government, and perhaps even the indigenous would supersede. With something like a council, I could imagine that they would not be superseding, but rather would work tangibly, tangibly, um, because there's just far more non-indigenous Canadians. I think indigenous Canadians make up less than 10% of the country. If I'm wrong, that please let me know in the comment section. I just don't see that working out, though, of that there would be enough to sort of make... Because with, with apartheid South Africa, there were far more um, black people living in South Africa than there were white people, right? The white people were the minority, I believe around 30%, if, if memory serves. But with Canada, that's the figures are reversed, right? And I just don't personally see that happening. I can see something where there's more cooperation with indigenous leaders and perhaps if the tribes could band together and create their sort of own governing system, right, that that could work in tangent with the Canadian government. So you could have indigenous elections where people that lived on indigenous lands, they would sort of elect basically members of parliament, if you will, as well as probably get a vote in the Canadian federal system. And so then you could sort of have, but then there might be power tensions between, ah, this is hard to think of on the spot, right? Hard to think of on the spot, but it's a fascinating idea. Let me know what you guys think below. Oh boy, this is getting long. I just realized so half an hour. I don't really buy into Tyranny. the idea that okay. all democracies inevitably fall into dictatorship, but it certainly seems po yeah, look at possible that at some point, the dominant values of Canadian politics could shift in some dramatic way that basically puts a halt to the slow growth of liberal democracy that has defined our previous centuries. If Canada ever became some sort of authoritarian state, the country would still survive in a literal sense, but it would have also strayed so far from its founding purpose, yeah. it would have also died in some very critical way. One possible scenario for this outcome that I discussed in a recent column for the Washington Post was that the United States becomes a dictatorship first and Canada then swiftly becomes a dictatorship in response as well. I know that this is quite other. counter to the way that a lot of Canadians would like to imagine this sort of thing would go down. You look at a work of Canadian fiction like The Handmaid's Tale and Canada is presented in this very flattering way as the part of the continent that stays free after America falls to tyranny and even provides a refuge for fleeing Americans. In practice though, I think if America ever did collapse into some sort of fascist regime, Canada's elite, who tend to be pretty anti-American at the best of times, would probably feel incredibly vindicated and cocky and 
use the fall of America as a pretext to implement a bunch of regressive policies to lock in their own rule. In other words, if there was no more United mm. States, a future Canadian government would probably feel more enabled to ban freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and restrict the media and end free and fair elections because these would all be seen as dumb and discredited American ideas that even uh, America itself okay. clearly did not believe in. It would be kind of like what happened in the 1940s in France after they failed to fend off a German invasion. The French political establishment just kind of concluded that democracy was no longer the pony to bet on and established their own fascist dictatorship to defend what was left of their sovereignty. You I'm so glad he brought that up. So I'm actually reading a book right now by Ian Kershaw on the 20th, 20th century European history and to make Long story short, because this video is getting long enough, already in the 1930s, there was a lot of far left and far right parties that both called into question the Third Republic. Not everyone was satisfied with the Third Republic in French society. And so there were tons of different leagues that were formed in France. Um, and there were mostly young men that, that joined these, mostly disaffected from the war. And they called into question the sort of Third Republic the third way democracy, sorry, not the third way, the third republic um, and democracy overall and created these leagues on both sides of the political spectrum. When the Nazis invaded, um, uh, sorry, when the, when, yeah, when the Nazis, uh, when the Nazi government invaded France and installed the puppet state in Vichy France, which is what this is here, they had selected people that were already established in this sort of right league as well as Philippe Pétain, who's a very controversial figure, interesting guy, look him up if you're interested. Um, so to say that there was already the infrastructure there in this example within Vichy, France, that I, just, I don't think exists right now in Canada. Okay, maybe in 10, 15 years, sure. And maybe if America did fall to so-called tyranny, which I also think wouldn't happen, but I digress. Um, actually, today's... Uh, I'm not going to get into it. But um, I don't think that that current system exists. And so tyranny in the Canadian sense... I don't think that it would be like Margaret Atwood's where it's just the complete opposite and we would be this free, amazing, perfect land. But I would imagine that perhaps like something parliament would be suspended and certain rights would be limited. But to say that they would axe freedom of speech, axe freedom of the press, not don't don't agree on that as much. I think that there would have to be systems that we would have to change for our government to align ourselves more with this new tyrannical American one. That's just my theory. You could imagine some future Canadian government making a similar argument that a collapsed and possibly hostile America necessitates the need for Canada to become a dictatorship too, to defend our independence and negotiate with the new American regime on a strong footing and so on. But even- It would also really depend on who's in power at the time. Both parties, I think the conservatives and liberals have a very different way of looking at that, but again, they're pretty similar when it all comes down to it. Independent of this wild scenario, my guess would be that Canada of the future is probably on track to be less, not more free, and that anti-American nationalism will probably play a large role in that. I just think that the supposed need to protect Canada from American influences and American problems and even American ideas has traditionally proven itself to be a pretty flexible justification that can be used to rationalize a lot of bad ideas. And assuming nationalism remains strong 80s. across this country, or even grows, I think it is a fair bet to believe we will continue to see nationalism evoked as a pretext to restrain what Canadians can see, hear, say, or even vote for. But what if things go the exact opposite way? Why, then we would be in scenario three. Mm. So from the earliest days, elites in Canada have worked hard to discourage Canadians from wanting to join up with the more rich and powerful United States, usually by portraying the United States as a wicked and repulsive place that ordinary Canadians should hate and fear. The exact reasons we are supposed to hate and fear America have changed a lot over the centuries, noticeably shifting from right to left, as I discussed in my award-winning video on Canadian nationalism. Today's Canadian nationalism is very much bound up in a kind of progressive populist rhetoric that, as we talked about earlier, is very tied to things like public health care and gun control and abortion rights and 
other stuff that resonates with members of this country's secular and often quite nervous suburban middle class. Yeah. This is yeah. a class of people who care a lot about affordability and safety and are thus highly susceptible to portrayals of America as a very dangerous, expensive place that threatens middle class dreams. But you know And this also sort of plays in this meme, because um, I'd, I'd call it a meme to be honest, overseas too, where a lot of people that I meet, they think Canada is this left-wing perfect utopia where everything's amazing and it's totally different from the United States. But Canadians and Americans have way more in common than Canadians have with Brits or Germans or Swedes or Mexicans or, or whatever, right? We have way more in common with Americans than anything. And yeah, so I, there is this definitely this anti-Americanism that I've experienced in, in my life. Um, as a Canadian, but I don't know, does that get worse or better over time? I'm not really sure off the top of my head. I'm... No, even the strongest nationalism can break down over time if the context in which it originally arose ceases to exist. For Canada to end its experiment with nationalism and just join up with the US already, I think a few things would have to happen along the way. One would be that people would just have to start talking about the idea more in an open sort of way. Right now, the idea of having Canada join the US is this very, very taboo topic in Canada because it is seen as being incredibly unpatriotic. Oh, it's just stupid too. I mean, why? <laughs> Right? There, something insane would have to happen. It's just. Even though polls suggest yeah. it is not nearly as fringe of a belief as, say, voting for the Green Party. Oh, nice little dig there. A lot of nationalism is based on stereotyping the other. And I do think that a lot of Canadian stereotypes of America and Americans are harder to sustain at a time when the technologies of the modern yeah, world definitely. have made it easier for Canadians to know Americans and visit America than ever before. Second, for union to happen, I do think that the United States would have to be seen as less threatening to the Canadian middle class. This is See, I wonder though, with that information and all the news that you get, right? Does that, but with the, what would you say? shocking news, I suppose, that comes out of the United States. Do you think that hardens Canadians and makes them more afraid of Americans because they hear all the different things that are happening to become more aware of it and they compare it more to their own country, even though that they know more Americans? Or does it facilitate an open communication and make them more, what would you say, open to uh, 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 fighting back against this anti-American narrative? Off the top of my head, kind of a hard dichotomy to, to, to decide right here, but... Let me know what you guys think. It isn't that hard to imagine, though it does depend a lot on the political trajectory of both nations. If Canada went through a significant phase of reformist conservative rule, and the US went through an equally reformist phase of progressive rule, I think it is easy to imagine the social policies of both countries meeting somewhere in the middle. Again, we are talking about like decades in the future, not just like an election or two from now. Yeah, but by true. like the year 2080 or so, it doesn't strike me as that unlikely that there could be a lot more cross-border consensus on issues like healthcare or gun control than there is today. And what I think could be more interesting is that we Nice, per nice face to pause on. What I think could be more interesting would be like if we had an EU style border between the USA and Canada. Maybe that could be interesting, but I mean, in reality, we have we have so much free trade, we have so much interlinking between the two. I don't know. I need to gather my thoughts on this issue. And the third condition is that both countries would have to see a union as being in their clear material benefit. The yeah. Canadian journalist Diane Francis wrote a rare book in 2013 advocating a merger of Canada and the US, largely on economic terms, and largely because she said that this would be a way that Canada could help the US maintain its superpower status in the context of a world facing the growing threat of mm. a rising China. She is somewhat sympathetic to the idea of a more planned economy, so she was very into the prospect of a single state exercising consolidated control over North America as a better way to manage the wealth and interests of this continent, as opposed to what we are doing now with our current system of endlessly overlapping and redundant agencies and laws and regulations and so forth. If the US and especially Canada were to experience okay. a very prolonged period of sluggish economic growth, you could see the case for a US-Canada merger seeming increasingly attractive to leaders on both 
sides, just as the previously taboo idea of free trade with America became increasingly attractive in the late 1970s and early 1980s in Canada, when the economy seemed to be in a similar downturn. When you and that took almost a decade to, to fall on. And actually the conservatives were pro-free trade and the liberals were anti-free trade, which, yeah, kind of interesting how parties pr progress over time. Look at some of the great bursts of prolonged economic growth in the past in both Canada and the US. They tend to correlate with significant paradigm shifts. Women entering the workforce, for instance, or World War II. East Germany experienced a big boost in growth when it merged with West Germany, as did many of the poorer Which nations Germany of Europe after they joined the EU. So in a dire enough economic environment, the Canadian provinces becoming states of the US could wind up looking like a fairly rational thing to future generations. But only if the future also winds up being an era less nationalistic than our own. So yeah, I feel like cool. we covered a lot of ground in this video. Obviously, all predictions about the future tend to be horribly myopic, backed by little evidence beyond wildly extrapolating from the present, and mine are no different. As any student of history knows, the timeline of humanity is much more wild and fluid than we give it credit for, and shocks can emerge when we least expect them. So I would be curious to hear some of your predictions about me the long-term future of Canada, how the country as we know it today might or end, your country. and especially what sort of big changes you think might happen that no one sees coming today. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week. And thank you, JJ, for making a wonderful video. Yes, so let me know what you guys think the future of Canada, if you are Canadian, maybe the future of America, if you're American, right, or of Europe, or of any, well, I've already did a video on the future of Europe, but I digress. Let me know what you guys thought. I really enjoyed this video. I, I liked how he used a bit more evidence. And as he says to, you know, his theories, my theories, what if all his theories probably won't happen at all. It's bold of anyone to try and bet against God, as what if all said in one of his most recent videos. 45 minutes. Thank you all very much. If you haven't yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.